So good having you all in this program, a Healy's Talk Show. Plenty thanks to God. Vivid view. Sick and do it. Don't fear the weapon, fear the man. Say something, somebody. Don't fear the weapon, fear the man. It actually talks about the heart of a man, how you can't see the heart of a man, but you can actually see the weapon in his hands. So it's the mind, the mindset that he's carrying, the kind of mind he's carrying, either good or bad, that would actually uh, prove if he's going to hurt you or not. My name is Organes Uweme Bradu. Don't fear the weapon, fear the man. A weapon is anything that can be used to fight or harm someone in a battle. And actually, anything can be weaponized. So your fear is not the weapon, which can be something that can used to be used to harm you. It is the fear of the person behind the weapon. Your fear is actually whether the person is rational or whether the person is irrational or if the person has a good heart or he has an evil heart. So. A good person with something that is actually a weapon will not harm you. A bad person with a very little weapon would harm you. So your fear should not be the weapon or anything that can be weaponized, but the person behind that weapon. Thank you so much for your response from the audience. Don't fear the weapon, fear the man. It's very direct, actually, like some of you have noted. It is the man that can pull the trigger. If we, are, if we are using gun, for example, you know, just being afraid of the gun is not, it's not enough because the gun itself cannot shoot except somebody pulls the trigger. And so it is important for you to be very careful, especially you youths. You are just going to somewhere, some uniform men flag you down and start talking to you and you please, they have weapon. So whether it's loaded or not loaded, it's not the issue. But we assume that it's always loaded. So don't argue with them unnecessarily. Do whatever they ask you to do because of that weapon. You can, you can put. I have got some instances where you might say, "You think because I'm afraid you're afraid because you have a weapon? Shoot! And I want to do shoot. I'm not afraid. Shoot! Eh uh eh. -uh. Now this time, oh, everybody is hungry. <laughs> There's hunger in the land. I ask somebody, shoot, and I think I think I'm afraid of shoot. He will pull the trigger before your family will find out that case. You take three, four years. So please don't ever be so annoyed or be so insensitive to whoever is holding. The, the weapon, whether it's knife or, or cutlass or gun or whatever, please be very, very uh, careful while de dealing with them for your own life. For your own life. So, we'll go straight to the discussion for today. Obviously, the present economic situation in our country, particularly, is gone beyond alarming state. Very, very scary. Where do we go from here? Insecurity and kidnapping, a major threat to economic stability, is the topic for today's discussion. It is time for a break, and when we come back, the guests will be introduced. Don't go away, please. Vivid view. Sit and do it. Welcome back. The topic again is insecurity and kidnapping, a major threat. To economic stability and with me in the studio is a security consultant let's make welcome michael san wobo vivid view say and do it before discussion proper please follow on our social media handles as displayed on the screen mr mike you're welcome again thank you for having me please here. quickly just give us your perspective yeah, on this um, subject matter insecurity the prevailing situation in the country is um, really terrible. If we look at the last three months, it's been really bad. In January alone, from reported incidents, we had over 700 abductions across Abuja and the northwestern states alone. In February, it reduced a bit. In March, we are still in March, it hasn't Perfect. ended. In Kaduna alone, um, the last few days, 286 was kidnapped, primary and secondary school, school children. School. We had another 60 that was kidnapped. We had another 87 that was taken away some days ago. And we have um, another 15, um, 14 females, one male, that were also taken in the same Kaduna, that is Kaduna alone. 
So the insecurity challenge that we have is really telling on um, the psyche of um, Nigerians. It's telling on development. It's telling on progress. Without um, peace, there cannot be any development. That is my take. It's so sad, like I opened, I said, where do we go from here? It's so scary what we are hearing, what is happening. It's so really so, so scary. I just pray that God will help us because it's only prayer now. Because we, the masses, we are handicapped. We still look, look onto, into, onto our, our government, you know, to, to do something that can, you know, save us from this problem that we find ourselves in. Are there political dimensions to rise of insecurity and kidnapping? Do you think so? Yes, I want to believe to an extent there are political dimensions to it um, because if you monitor the media and you monitor the activities of the so-called bandits, I hate to call them bandits, they are terrorists. Um, you will have heard them make one or two demands. In the past, they have... Um, a few governments, Kassina and Farah, have granted amnesty, but they still come to make demands, demands that are targeted at um, the federal government. And then only a few days ago, a popular Muslim cleric with ties to this terrorist, um, Sheikh Gumi, Gumi yeah. was on air <laughs> on various platforms advocating that um, amnesty be granted these terrorists, that they should be listened to, that they have demands for quality life and what have you. So there's a political dimension to it. And then the fact that... Um, a few political actors themselves are not taking these things as seriously as we expect them to. So it makes one begin to wonder the level of collaboration, the level of negligence, or is it deliberate um, acts that um, help to foil these challenges? So there is a political dimension to it, no doubt about that. Even if you go to other parts of the country, the Southeast, their political dimensions to the agitations there, there are cries of marginalization, injustice, but then again, non-state actors involved in these um, security challenges also use these things to perpetrate acts of violence and um, insecurity. Because I'm just imagining why we have an increase if there's no new political uh, dimension to this. Because increasing every day, that means uh, there are people behind the scene. Um, Honestly, there are some people behind this scene that don't want, you know, Nigerians to have peace. I, I don't care whatever they call themselves, cabal or touchables or, or, and all that. Because otherwise, we'll have been able to provide solution to this. Well, you know, so it's, it's, it's really alarming, like I said before, and it's um, becoming very, very scary to, to, the, to the masses. Living here in Nigeria is almost like living in hell. May God help us out. We'll take a break now. Vivid View. See and do Welcome back. We are still discussing security and kidnapping, a major threat to economic stability. Then how does insecurity affect our economy and foreign investors? Thank you for that direct question. Mm -hmm. um, like I said before, where there's no peace, there can't be development. Um, secondary school economics. If you go back to your secondary school economics notes, it tells you that um, the entrepreneur takes into consideration certain things before he puts his capital. You know, they look at um, location of resources, they look at availability of labor, they look at the environment. Is it enabling enough? So at this level, when you're talking foreign investors, they have to look at the political and economic climate. They have to look at the security challenges. Are they going to be able to operate unhindered? Are they going to be able to make profits? So these are issues that they have to consider. And um, where investors cannot come in, whether local or foreign, the economy begins to die gradually. Of course. Especially with respect to Foreign companies leaving. Yes, closing up and leaving. Closing Nigeria. up and leaving and some going to neighboring African countries. Besides the foreign investors, local companies are also folding up. Yes. 
and a lot of warehouses and former factories are being taken up by religious houses who are selling hope to the people. So security is um, it's very important when it comes to foreign investments and growth. If we look at a couple of states in the country today, um, a couple of states like Lagos witness economic activities, booming economy, because it is relatively safer than other places. But if you were to think of some other states far north or in the east, you will see that um, economic investments are beginning to dwindle and they are beginning to reduce drastically. And when this happens, it leads to unemployment. It leads to a lot of other things. It leads to poverty. It leads to underdevelopment. And then... Um, leads to scarcity of food. Yes, yeah, scarcity of food. It yes. leads to... It leads even to... Because then people who have been laid off and then the human human being is made to survive. You know, survival instincts come to play. They may take to unorthodox means, which includes crime, to want to survive. So, um, it's a huge one. It's a really huge one. Yes, it actually opens up to so many things. Yeah. Open way to so many things, actually. Crimes and all that, as you just mentioned, when, when the economic is not stable. And uh, the inflation rate now has almost risen to above 30%. Inflation rate. Because the farmer has supposed to be in the farm, are scared to go to the farm because of kidnapping and even killing them and uh, you know taking their their goods and all that. So, so you can see what we are really experiencing. Why I said earlier that living in this country on the most general looks as if we are now in hell. So it's only God and our government need to take this very seriously. We have been t talking about it for the past twenty years when all these things start coming on so so visibly. So I think our people need to get up now and do the needful. We have what it takes to put an end to this. Sure. If they really mean it. This is the truth of the matter. Sure. So um, I want to ask again, if, if you don't mind, are there really beneficiaries from onslaught of these kidnappers? Oh, basically. Um, people benefiting from it. That's why they, they, they hams, the ransom they are giving in millions, billions. Basically, people benefit. Um, if we yes, look at you see the amount of people are, are calling. You, you, it's amazing. Yeah. Calling 60 billion, 100 billion, 200 billion to, to rescue people. You know what I mean? The last people who took away 286, 287 primary and secondary school peoples have made a demand for 1 trillion. Oh, can you imagine? How is it going to get to them? Do we even have some people in Nigeria who, in the first Even place? if the government is going to pay, there are people along the distribution chain that will benefit exactly. before that cash gets there. And then I mean, in the past, ransom had been paid to terrorists, to bandits and what have you. And they, they have are been still, giving they are still... motorcycles, they have been giving cash. People benefit. And then I like us to look at kidnapping. You know, you have kidnapping for rituals and you have kidnapping for ransom. Rituals, whether for traditional ritual purposes or for organ harvesting, they are beneficiaries at the end of the behind the distribution mm -hmm. chain. So for ransom, it's the same thing. There are people who are benefiting. But you see, like um, we sit down to always talk about governments, governments, governments. It is, it, they say a society deserves the government it gets. Mm -hmm. We all have a role to play ourselves. We have a role into determining who our leaders should be. When you have leaders who have their thoughts well um, screwed up, They'll go there to make policies and take decisions that will pay us. But when you have people who are going for, who are going into governance for selfish motives, yeah, you, these are the things that we'll get to. It's increasing by the day. Um, some years ago, the United States made a prediction with respect to the fact that Nigeria will not exist at a certain time. Yes, we are still existing after that prediction, but we are slowly, slowly and deliberately moving well, towards that prediction. That prediction. Hmm. Um, if not for the resolve of a few thinking people, we may have, Nigeria may have gone the way of Afghanistan. But then, there is so much to be done. Our criminal justice system is weak. They pick kidnappers, they pick terrorists, they pick bandits. Do you hear of those cases being concluded in court or them being punished adequately? No. When they are paraded, that's the end you hear. What happens thereafter, you don't know. So our criminal justice system is, is something that we have to focus on. For a lot of us here, we have to hold our officials accountable, be it local government chairman, be it councillor, 
be it legislator, be it anybody, we have to hold them accountable. So these are issues that um, we ourselves as citizens, we need to take cognizance of. It is not alone for the government. We have to continue to do our bit. Time for a break now. Vivid view. Say I'm doing. Welcome back. We are still discussing security and kidnapping, a major threat to economic stability. Well, a lot of things have already been said in our discussion, and uh, we believe that we are passing message to those who are consigned to really sit up and solve this problem once and for all. How do we genuinely combat insecurity and kidnapping, including government and other stakeholders? So not just government alone this time. Let me start yeah. from us, the citizens. Genuinely is Yes, the let me start there. from us, citizens. <clears throat> um, if, we take, if we take a sense of, of those who are here now, and uh, we ask for who has the number of the DP or the area command, you'll find out that the number will fall on the low parts. We are not security conscious to a large extent as expected. From the individual point of view, we need to raise our consciousness. We need to be aware of what is happening in our surroundings. We need to have those contacts, government contacts responsible for the jurisdictions of where we stay, to be able to and report anything suspicious that we see. Then um, I said something about linking it to our involvement in politics. We need to push forward people who have the sincere mindset to do things for us. Because at the end of the day, um, what is the population of the policemen that we have in Nigeria? We don't have up to four or five hundred thousand. But we have a huge chunk who are with senators, who are with ministers, who are with those in government at every level, including governors. So what is left for us, the citizenry? You see that at the end of the day, we are being shortchanged. If you look at the fight against um, insurgency, insecurity, and what have you, how well equipped is the army? What is the landmass of Nigeria? What is the population of the army, air force, and navy put together? Do we have enough resources to sustain drones and aircraft for surveillance purposes in the air? to begin to crime up and to follow up with um, act, non-state actors. We don't have that. But the National Assembly, the budget for the National Assembly this year can take care of 26 universities, the budget of 26 federal universities. So these are things that we need to take into perspective. We need to hold our leaders accountable. It is not about sharing rights, receiving rights, and what have you, getting palliatives, and then we go to sleep. At the end of the day, will be the people who will feel the brunt of all these their indecisions and what have yeah, you. Yeah, they're already protected. Yeah. With all the soldiers you just mentioned around them. So they don't, they don't feel that. They so don't it's up to us. Feeling. It's up to us. We have to ask questions. We have to make suggestions. Um, if the National Assembly can be taking so much without same going to security, even some of the ones that go to security, we know how it ends up. We have seen a few generals that have been tried and monies retrieved from them. We have seen the same thing. There's rot in the system. Like I said before, our criminal justice system is poor. So if we can strengthen it, let there be deterrence. Because there's a lack of deterrence in our society, people begin to behave anyhow. That is what has given rise to insecurity. Somebody can just get up today, pick a gun, shoot, make noise. After a few talks, he becomes a hero of sorts to some people. He's not tried. He's not arrested. Nothing happens to him. Moving freely. Mm -hmm. Moving freely. And then before you know it, a, a couple of political actors will surround him and beef him up. It has happened across the geo, yeah. um, political zones of the country. Yes. It is when the person now steps on huge toes that you see security forces come after the person. Yeah. There's a lack of deterrence. There's a huge level of anyhowness, permit me to speak that, to use that word. So there's no deterrence. Evans, the kidnapper, has he been convicted? He's still going to from one courtroom to the other. So these are clear examples. When he used his mouth to confess what he did. He used his mouth to confess what he did, the crime yeah. he committed. Yeah. And they are still putting him in there. What are they waiting for? What are they waiting to convict him? 
That's why I say so scared what's happening now. It is. And it's, it's beyond alarming state now. And we, the masses, are the ones suffering. Because sure. these people feel they are already protected. They and their families are protected. You just mentioned how many policemen or men do we really have. Three quarter of it is guiding individuals. Only one quarter they live for masses over 200 million. These armies are guiding. They are not up to 1,000 in this country. But they have so much guiding them. For me, for us to work and solve this problem genuinely, it's two things I have in mind. I have in mind because somebody had to speak the truth. If you will miss me dying for the nation, I switch that I'm a hero, yes. That is truth of the matter. It's one, the first thing we will do for me, for that gumi that is asking for negotiation. I want our president to give him that audience, but not to negotiate for money to give them. Negotiate for them to break all their people, all our bushes. They have surrendered all the bushes in Nigeria. Call them back to, to the north. Because if you hear testimony or narratives from the Captains, victims, yeah. you, they will tell you that they, they speak their full any people. They will only pick one full that can start small broken that will not help the negotiation. They don't speak in the, they speak our That is why they should tell them, Gumi should tell them to bring out, call them back to, so that we know how many they are. And call and, and accept them. Nigerians are receptive. They're already in Nigeria to live with us. Truly, they're not supposed to be in the bush. They are human beings like us. They're not supposed to be in the bush. Somebody brought them in here for, poli for politics. That's what I say, yeah, political dimensions. And, and when you now, you know, you're able to win in politics, you couldn't tell them back or settle them. That story has been there. That's why they're not in the bush. They are not it. What do you expect them when they're already living like animals? Contending with, with, with this, the, you know, these harmful animals, snakes, snakes are all in the bush. What do you expect them? That's why if they capture anybody, they don't have mercy. Because they're already behaving like animals. So let's bring them out from the bushes. Let Gumi help us to bring them out from the bush. The, the, the governors and northern governors can discuss where they will put them. And build, uh, within six months, we can build something for them. Let them come out. And not cooperate with us. <laughs> that is the only way out. Government has the money. The money used to pay them ransom. Money used to use to do other things. Use it now to build place and let them come out. They, they continue to, we have ourselves a full and are living be, before. They are good people. We, we, we work with them. We cohabit with them. They would, would not have all these killings then. But this one that can not infiltrate them, let us give them place. You can imagine the, the come, coming to some villages in the north, they will displace the person that owns house and enter. And you that own house, you're now in IIDP. Come here, I mean, and for years this has been happening. I labeled to build my house. Somebody has come and took me with gun, take me out of my house, and is still occupying my house. And, and I'm now the one now in IDP. And yes, our government has seen closing their eyes to this. Please hear us. Enough is enough. Yes. You have to come out of 